All right, let's dive in. So aloha and welcome to our talk today on hacking vice in Russia. My name is Patrick. I am the chief research officer at Digida Security. Briefly, Digida is working to create cybersecurity Mac tools for the enterprise. Today, I'm stoked to be presenting with my good friend Mike, also former coworker. Uh, Mike is a security researcher and one of the most talented members of the Synac Red Team. Briefly, Synac provides uh, penetration testing via trusted, a trusted global crowd of vetted security researchers. All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be discussing a comprehensive hacking operation. We're going to be starting with discussing our mission and our target. And then we're going to talk about the steps we took to gather information or intelligence about our target. Then, once we had this intelligence, so armed with this information, we're going to show how we were able to craft uh, various attacks that allowed us to gain initial access to the target. From that, we're then going to discuss more persistent remote access, as well as some custom capabilities we developed that allowed us to gain access to all aspects of the target's digital world. And then finally, we're going to end the talk by discussing some mitigations that likely would have thwarted or at least compl complicated our attacks. So first, who are we targeting and why? So our adventure started kind of randomly. Uh, Mike and I were both in Russia to present at the PH Days Hacker Conference. Vice News was also in attendance. They were shooting an episode about Russian hackers and hacking in Russia. And they reached out to us, basically saying, hey, can you guys hack our producer? I guess they really wanted to give her maybe a hands-on Russian conference hacking experience. Now, we were a little wary. I mean, we're foreigners in Russia and hacking over there. Eh, a little sketchy. But they promised us that if we were successful, we could be on HBO. So yeah, we're not going to turn that down, right? So the vice producer, the correspondent we were targeting, is a lady named Gianna Toboni. And she's traveled all over the world for Vice News, covering all sorts of amazing stuff. Uh, you know, some pretty intense stuff as well, so conflicts, uh, wars. And now, as I mentioned, she was in Russia digging into Russian hacking. So very brave of her. As I mentioned, we were in Moscow attending the Positive Hack, or PH Days, conference. Uh, unfortunately, it's just a two-day conference. So our opportunity to hack Gianna was very limited, very short. Plus, as I mentioned, as you can imagine, if you're a foreigner in Russia, this isn't really the ideal place to go after someone. But you know, we were up for the adventure. So gathering intelligence in general is kind of a tricky business. And especially if you have to do it in an unknown location we've never been to before, and you have such a serious time crunch. For that, in order for that to be successful, you need some goals. And our goals were to execute a cyber attack and a more traditional espionage type of an attack. Now, for our cyber attack, we wanted to uh, get on, on uh, our target's devices and basically just exploit them, get information out of there. For that, we needed to know what they were. Uh, then, uh, once we know what the devices are, we should be able to actually figure out what attack vectors we should be using for that. So essentially, we're trying to bridge the gap between capabilities and the attack parameters. Of course, the only way to do that is through pure ingenuity. Now, in order to figure out what, uh, what devices she is using, uh, we did a little bit of open source intelligence. Now, uh, our target, uh, Gianna, she's quite a popular figure. You know, she travels the world and does all kinds of interviews. And so we've been able to essentially just use Google, look up some of the devices that she's been using for her interviews and to do her work. And we can see here that she's using a MacBook Pro to interview one of her sources. Then we've been able to follow her around in the hotel and just through a line of sight determine that she's using an iPhone to do her sort of casual work uh, whenever she's in cafes or lunch, what have you. And so this allowed us to tailor our attacks to the Apple products. Initially, we thought that we would use something like uh, a phishing attack in order to get her to execute some malware. However, phishing attacks are great against large organizations because you really have numbers on your side. You know, it's a tried and true method that pretty much works every time. However, if you have someone who 
is you know a single person, and uh, you know they they you know they they're one person. And maybe they have some good cyber hygiene. They they've been tra trained by a company, or they're just tech savvy. You know that attack doesn't work very well. So we wanted to do something a little bit uh, closer in her personal space, and we chose to do a, a rogue access point attack. This way we can control her network space really well from our point of view. Uh, for our physical attack, we wanted to do something called the evil maid attack, which means essentially just entering into a hotel room and messing with devices that way. Uh, but for that, we needed to know her exact location, exact room, uh, and also her schedule, because if you're uh, kind of breaking into the hotel room and she's in there, it can get really awkward really fast. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that we're doing for kind of our plan B, because we want to make sure we cover all the bases, uh, just, to, just in case our cyber attack doesn't work out. All right, so this is the hotel we were staying at. This is also the hotel uh, uh, that the conference was hosted at. Uh, so we figured this is where Gianna would be staying as well. And of course, we also saw her walking around, so that was a pretty good giveaway. Now, in order to actually execute the stack, we need to know her room number, and we don't want to uh, accidentally break into a wrong person's room. Again, that gets really awkward really fast. As we were kind of thinking about different ways of doing that, uh, you know, maybe follow her around or whatever it is, we realized that there was actually an easier way. We realized that there was a law in the Russian Federation that required every person to uh, authenticate using first name, last name, and middle name before they use any sort of public Wi-Fi. Now, we can kind of debate this, uh, the efficacy and the purpose of this law over beers, but the point is we were able to leverage it for our purposes. And here you can see that the uh, first name that the hotel uses, uh, because they, they want to make this easier for their guests. So the first name uh, is used, sorry, the uh, username is the hotel number or the room number, and the password is her um, last name. And of course, we know her last name, so we just need to figure out what uh, room number she's in. So this is kind of where the fun begins. We quickly reverse engineer the captive screen that's used for authentication to the Wi-Fi. And we determine that we can run a script on sort of from our laptop without having to log into the, the Wi-Fi first, and essentially iterate through all the room numbers, uh, check uh, the password and the room number together and see if it's successful. Of course, like I said, we know her password is her last name. And there are only so many rooms in this hotel, right? So we kind of iterated through about 2,000 of them until we eventually discovered that if you enter room 2086, you get to log into the Wi-Fi. And that's how we knew which room she was staying in. Now, you might think, when you're staying at RSA, whatever hotel you're in, uh, perhaps that's the similar kinds of methodology used to authenticate to the Wi-Fi. So given this information, we decided to do um, a slight social engineering um, trick or tech. Uh, we needed someone with uh, sort of a female voice and um, something American sounding. So we solicited the assistance of my wife, who is sitting right there in the audience. Thanks, Diana. <laughs> Uh, she used Skype to prevent any sort of traceability to call to the reception desk and say that she is Gianna Taboni and she is staying in room 2086. That's enough to authenticate, apparently. And she requested that Patrick was going to be given a key to her room because he's going to be stopping by later on. Uh, at first, uh, and then about 10 minutes later, um, Patrick went downstairs to the reception and said, uh, hey, can I have a room to the to ha have a key to this room uh, because I'd like to go visit my colleague? At first, the receptionist was kind of trying to do the right thing. She said, "Well, um, I'm going to call the guest and confirm that this request is fine." Now, Patrick is very smart. He was very quick on his feet, and he's like, "No, no, no, no. You know, she's sleeping. Uh, very tiring trip. Please don't disrupt her." But she did call uh, just a few minutes ago, and she said that this was going to be fine. <coughs> At this point, the receptionist kind of looked around and she saw a sticky note that had Patrick's name on it. And she was like, oh, yeah, this is totally fine. Here's a room, uh, room key. <laughs> uh, so it, it's a super low bar for authentication. I mean, I, I don't know how this, this really qualifies as, as comfort level, right? 
So that made me super uncomfortable. Maybe at the same time, you know, the Russians were hacking us in the same hotel. Who knows? Uh, but the, what's interesting is that this is not just some random hotel. This is a brand name hotel who takes security seriously. And seriously enough that they actually had metal detectors at the front entrances. They just don't seem to think that cyber is a real problem. All right, so this is kind of our uh, results of this little intel gathering operation. Uh, through open source intelligence, we've been able to figure out what devices she's using and tailor our attack towards that. We decided to use the rogue access point. Uh, using social engineering and a mix of a cyber attack, we've been able to figure out her room number and get uh, a key uh, so that we can do a physical attack against her uh, laptop. So now that we have enough information to execute, execute some attacks, let's actually dive deep and see what we've done to get initial access to our target. So the device we used uh, when we were trying to uh, do our uh, cyber attack is actually the, something called the Hutu Travelmate. I, I have it right here. As you can see, it's a very sort of cute and small device. It's, a, it's about a form factor of uh, the MacBook uh, power adapter. Uh, it's super versatile. It's got two antennas, so you can have two Wi-Fi um, uh, networks that it can connect to, or one, one that it creates and the other one that it connects to, so it bridges them together. Uh, it's very easy to dispose of. It's, it's quite cheap. It runs Linux. It's got a battery pack. So you can literally just kind of put it in the corner somewhere and wait for uh, some victims to come by. So we use that to create a, um, a, a Wi-Fi access point with the name of Crown Plaza Guest. Because obviously, that's a little bit more enticing. If you're a guest at Crown Plaza, that's where you might want to log in as a legitimate uh, user. Now, we also bridged the two Wi-Fi's so that once you log in, log in, you don't really see that there's anything uh, special going on. It might be slightly slower, but usually Wi-Fi uh, in the hotels is pretty slow anyway. So we looked for a place where the uh, legitimate Wi-Fi might be slightly weaker, and our Wi-Fi might be slightly st stronger, and with the name together, it's quite an enticing proposition to connect to that specific access point. Once the target actually logs into our Wi-Fi, they are presented with a similar screen that they would be presented on the uh, legitimate Wi-Fi. You know, here we are asking for the room number and her last name as the password. Potentially, that's another mechanism that we could have used to, uh, to find out which room she's staying in. Uh, but I quite like the other method because it doesn't require any target interaction. So there's a little bit higher chance of success. Well, actually, it's 100%. Um, to generate this uh, captive screen, we used uh, DNS redire redirection, which is a very common methodology used by many public Wi-Fis in order to get people to authenticate, give up any private information, what have you. Once the user uh, or the target has authenticated, we connect them to, or we connected her to the real uh, access point, to the real uh, internet, so that she can continue browsing. However, we didn't, we didn't stop redirecting um, at will. We actually redirected websites such as vice.com, yelp.com, or anything that she is very likely to use while she's traveling. You know, she might want to eat at some restaurants, so yelp.com is quite useful for that. Uh, once we've done that redirection, what we're able to do is actually inject content into those websites. And injecting content means you get to control something on her browser, at which point we might be able to actually throw zero-day day attacks. Uh, now, zero-day attacks against browsers are quite expensive, and we were in Russia, we didn't want to lose that capability. So we kind of put that one in the back of our pockets and thought of a different method. Because uh, there are other ways to actually get the person to uh, sort of to infect the person's machine. And the method we used is essentially a uh, Mac malware packaged as a legitimate uh, software update. As you can see through this incredibly convincing uh, logo, it's clearly something that's coming from Apple. <laughs> and um, what we've done is we packaged together uh, an update that would install malware on her machine. Now, Apple kind of tries to uh, prevent this from happening uh, through something called the gatekeeper. It's a mechanism that's used to authenticate packages downloaded from the internet. 
However, it's not a very high bar to jump. There's tons of uh, ways to, to kind of get around that. And malware does that all the time. There's lots of uh, uh, Apple malware that essentially uses uh, stolen or fraudulent Apple credentials to uh, fool the gatekeeper into thinking that this package is fine to execute. And here we are leveraging a very common policy uh, with companies where they tell their users to keep the laptops up to date. Now, it's, a, it's generally a good policy. Uh, however, it's also prone to abuse in this way because when she was traveling, we were able to say, hey, I think your laptop is out of date. You really should update because of our policy. For our physical attack, like I said, we have the room key through our social engineering attack. Uh, we've been able to get into the room and uh, we found her laptop laying around. I think she went out to have a party or something of that nature. And so we, we had plenty of time to fiddle around with it. So we opened it up. We were able to make it boot into something called the recovery mode, which is a special mode for Apple devices that allows you to troubleshoot the system. But it also gives you access to the hard drive, the files, and allows you to modify them. Uh, and so through a USB, we basically put a malware onto it um, and waited for her to run it uh, at some time in the future. Uh, this is actually something that uh, I like to think it simulates a border crossing. So if you're going to uh, a country that might be slightly hostile to you, um, you know, they may request your laptop and take it into a back room and then execute a similar type of attack to gather all, some information, maybe install some malware, uh, what have you. Uh, however, this is actually fairly easy to thwart. Uh, if you enable firmware password and full disk encryption, uh, it prevents this from working. However, it's not turned on by default, so you have to act actively do that yourself. This is what the attack looks like. Uh, once you get into that special mode, you're essentially given a terminal, and you get all the commands that you'd expect from that terminal, and using a USB, you can uh, copy things onto the hard drive. Now, if, on the other hand, you do have firmware passwords installed and you have full disk encryption, there is uh, sort of another way you can level up and, and do a similar type of attack. Now, these devices have lots of uh, connectors. You know, you can connect your USB mouse, uh, USB stick, whatever it is. Uh, there's also a Thunderbolt devices that you can connect to. And they communicate through fairly complex protocols. You know, USB is a packet-based protocol that so has lots and lots of interactions. Um, and there may be uh, bugs and exploits hidden in that uh, environment. And so if you figure out to how to have an exploit in that environment, you may be able to uh, actually get access to the laptop that way. Um, we didn't have to do that. However, we did definitely find lots of evidence that this is possible. And come to think of it, I'm pretty sure, Patrick, that's your research paper, isn't it? Maybe? We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Um, for uh, our physical attack, like I said, as, as our sort of very good backup plan, we did something in the realm of the, the cloak and dagger. You know, we installed uh, surveillance cameras inside of the hotel room where we've been able to uh, sniff out her passwords and pin codes to her devices and come back later and install malware that way. Uh, now, this wasn't available to us uh, while we were executing this um, operation. But once we stole in the passwords, we could have been able to elevate privileges to administrator access and install malware that uh, would be able to hide really well through an attack that was discovered later on, where essentially, uh, if you want to become a root administrator on the machine, you just kind of click unlock several times, so you have to be really persistent, and then you can get access to the machine. So it's kind of too bad we didn't have that. Um, so I would say just really beware when you get room upgrades at hotels because they could be coming with, you know, fully upgraded with pre-installed surveillance equipment as well. This is uh, the evil maid attack in action. As you can see, Patrick over there is diligently installing the malware uh, on the laptop. <laughs> All right, so now we have access to the target's MacBook. So let's talk about delivering some persistent remote access, some capabilities. And our goal, again, is to really have full access to all aspects of the target's digital life. 
So accounts, Twitter, email, credit cards, passwords, maybe even the webcam on the mic. So we had several options to gain this persistent remote access. We could have enabled a backdoor account. We could have written our own implant, our own backdoor, or simply used an existing one. And we decided to go with the latter and use an existing piece of uh, malware called Empire. Empire is written in Python. It's a stealthy cross-platform agent. And it's open source and extensible, which is nice because we want to add some of our own custom capabilities. In terms of a command and control server, we just used a virtual machine on Google's cloud. This is cheap, easy, and somewhat deniable. If the target were to look at their traffic, they perhaps would just see some traffic going to Google's infrastructure, which might not raise suspicion. So in terms of persistence, we decided to go with a launch agent. Basically, a launch agent ensures that the implant will be automatically started every time the infected computer is rebooted. Now, if you're familiar with Windows services, launch agents and launch daemons on Mac OS are conceptually the same. So very common to use this technique in Mac malware, but it's very efficient. So what you do to create a launch agent is to create a plist or property list file. It's just an XML document, and you set various key value pairs. For example, the path to whatever you want to be executed, and a key such as run at load, which if set to true will tell the operating system, please automatically execute this. If you save this document to the launch agent directory, every time the infected Mac is restarted, whatever you specify to be executed will be executed by the operating system. So now we may want to get root privileges, because normally when you infect a computer, such as a Mac, you really need root to do more nefarious actions. Install a system-wide keylogger, access system files, et cetera. So the simplest way is kind of a social engineering attack, where basically you can just display an authentication prompt that the operating system will display on your behalf. And if the user enters their administrative credentials, you've gained root. So this works, but it's kind of lame, in my opinion. It requires user interaction and really not that stealthy. Real hackers are going to use zero days. And contrary to what Apple tells us, it's actually really easy to elevate your privileges on Mac. There's a ton of zero day local privilege escalation vulnerabilities. So this is what real hackers are going to use. Of course, these don't need any user interaction and are very stealthy. Also, if you have physical access, most of the attacks are going to give you root as a side effect of that as well. All right, so now we have root. Let's start doing some nefarious things. So the first thing we did was install a keylogger. A few months ago, I wrote an open source mouse and keyboard sniffer. I was analyzing some malware that would generate synthetic events, and I wanted to observe those. But since this open source research utility will sniff keystrokes, it also makes the perfect keylogger. So we maliciously packaged that up basically uses the core graphics framework. It's an Apple framework that allows you to capture low-level input events, such as user key presses. And when this is running, whenever the user presses, for example, the letter A, the operating system will deliver a notification to our code along with the, the key that the user pressed. So here's an example of that. It's a little video we're going to show. At the top, I'm tailing the keylogger capture file. This, again, has all the strokes that the user has pressed. And in the bottom, I'm logging into my bank account. This is a proof of concept to test that. So we can see I've gone to Bank of America. I'm typing in my user and my password, even in a secure browser field. And at the top, we can see that the keylogger has captured this. So obviously, this is a very powerful, very useful capability. We also wanted to dump the keychain. Why the keychain? Well, the keychain has a myriad of really awesome stuff, if you're a hacker. It has private keys, passwords, authentication tokens. And you can actually dump it as a normal user. You don't have to have root credentials. You can either do that via an API or use a utility such as Apple's security utility. Just execute it with the dump keychain command. Now, there is one caveat to this, in that, and that is that the operating system will first display a keychain access authentication prompt. And Apple has designed this authentication prompt to ignore synthetic events. So if we try to programmatically access it and click Allow, in theory, it will be blocked. Turns out, though, there's a way around this. So we used a legit feature of macOS called mouse keys. And mouse keys, when enabled, basically turns the keyboard into a mouse. So if you programmatically send a keyboard event, it'll get translated into a mouse event and then delivered. 
So in three steps, we first programmatically enable mouse keys. We open the system preference app using Apple Script, and then we browse to the accessibility pane and send a synthetic event to click the enable mouse keys. So now mouse keys are enabled. So the question is, can we send a synthetic event to that keylog access prompt to click allow, allowing us to dump the keychain? So what we do is we send the keypad number five. When mouse keys are enabled, this correlates to a mouse click. And the key code for this is 87. So on the slide, we're running the mouse and keyboard sniffer, which will detect mouse and keyboard events. And we can see when we programmatically send a key down and up event, the mouse and keyboard sniffer detects that. But we can also then see that the operating system has translated that key event to a mouse event and then delivered it for us. So here's a proof of concept in a POC demo in action. This is a POC application that's going to dump everything from the keychain synthetically click on that allow button in the background, and then exfiltrate everything to a netcat listener. So during the attack, we're obviously not going to use an application, but this is a little more illustrative. So the application is running in the background. It has invoked the security utility, and now is synthetically clicked on the allow. It's a little hard to see on the screen, but now we're opening a remote netcat listener. And in a few seconds, we can see all the contents of the keychain exfiltrated to our command and control server. This includes accounts and passwords in the clear. So again, very easy to dump the Apple keychain. This is now patched, but there's other ways to do this. We also wanted to record off the target's webcam. On modern Macs, this is not really that trivial because of the pesky LED indicator light. So it turns out, even if you have physical access, it's very difficult to disable that light. And obviously, that light will come on anytime the user or code is programmatically recording off the webcam. We didn't want to take that risk, because if the target was sitting at our laptop, for example, typing up an email, and all of a sudden the LED indicator light com comes on, that would be a dead giveaway that her computer was hacked. However, it turns out that the webcam is a shared resource. This means whenever the user is legitimately using it, malicious code could piggyback off that recording, and there would be no subsequent alerts, because the LED indicator light is already on. So what our malware does in three steps is it waits until the user initiates a legitimate webcam session, detects that, and then piggybacks onto that to record the session, even if the user is just using the webcam to broadcast themselves. And then obviously exfiltrates that out to the attacker. So I mentioned this works because the webcam is a shared resource, right? You can like Skype and FaceTime at the same time. Not sure why you'd want to, but this is great for our malware. So in a few lines of code, once we've detected that the user is using the webcam, we can simply record off the device in very few lines of code, very simple to do. So here's a screenshot of this all happening. Uh, on the right, you can see us kind of creepily watching <laughs> the target. She's having a Skype ses session with her fiance. But again, you know, Vice News was like, please do this. So yeah, that's kind of the thing. And again, because the LED indicator light is already on, because she's Skyping with her fiance, there's no secondary indication that we are piggybacking off this session and recording it. All right, so that was some neat capabilities that we baked into our persistent Mac implant. Really gave us access to everything about the target. So the end result was we got access to pretty much all of our accounts, uh, Twitter, email. Uh, we captured off the webcam. We recorded conversations on the phone by turning on the mic on the, the laptop, access to passwords and credit card information. We had some fun with this. We, for example, tweeted from a verified account and also took free Uber rides using our credit card number. So I'm not going to lie, that was a ton of fun. Uh, you know, a little nerve-wracking going up to a Russian hotel and you know, saying some nefarious things. Um, but I briefly wanted to kind of end by talking about some mitigations. So some mitigations that would have thwarted or at least complicated some of our attacks. So the first thing is, it's very important to realize that if someone really wants to hack you, they will succeed. I mean, you can imagine the Russian government wanting to target you specifically. They're probably going to get into your devices, even if you don't travel to Russia. Good example of this is the Pegasus malware. It used three iOS zero days to remotely infect iOS devices that were fully updated, fully patched, and non-jailbroken. Um, so again, this is kind of an example. But that doesn't mean all is lost. We can still take some steps to kind of make these attacks more difficult. So the first recommendation is take a burner device. A burner device is a phone or a laptop that has no personal data on it that when you get home, you burn or discard. 
The benefit of this is even if it gets hacked, eh, the hackers don't really have any information. It's also good to encrypt your traffic and make sure you're fully updated before you travel. Now, even with burner devices, a few words of advice. First, don't download anything, especially updates or required software. This will block a variety of attacks where hackers or adversaries are trying to remotely hack your system. Also, it's important not to log into any important accounts. Imagine your burner device is compromised, and then you log into your company's emails. You've just given the attackers that access. Now, there's some, also some great free Mac security utilities that I want to mention. I, I will caveat for full disclosure, I'm biased because I created these tools. But they're all free, a lot of them are open source, and they were really created to prevent these kind of attacks. So I kind of channeled my inner gray hat to build free Mac security tools. The first one is Block Block. I actually talked about this last year at RSA. And what it does is it monitors for persistence. So when an implant or a piece of code tries to persistently install itself, it will generate an alert. So if the target had been running this when we installed our back door, this big alert would have popped up. Another neat utility I'm working on is called Lulu. It's a free open source firewall for Mac OS. And as a firewall, it will block and alert the user about unauthorized network connections. So again, if the target had this running where, when our implant connected out, either for tasking or to exfiltrate data to our command and control server, the firewall would have blocked that and then alerted the user as well. Another utility I've written is called Oversight, and Oversight monitors your mic and your webcam. So yes, the LED indicator light will come on when the webcam is in use, but there will be no secondary indication if someone is piggybacking off that session. And worse, for the mic, there's no visible indication that the mic is in use. So what Oversight does is monitor both the mic and the webcam, and if anybody uses that or piggybacks off them, it will alert the user as to that fact. Finally, a new tool that was inspired by this is Do Not Disturb. This is currently in beta and will be released as soon as the iOS application is approved by Apple. It's currently pending review in the App Store. And what Do Not Disturb does is it tries to detect physical attacks. As I mentioned, evil maid attacks are a great way to gain access to someone's laptop. But a lot of these, if not all of these attacks, require that the laptop is awake and open. So if you go and shut your laptop when you leave, what Do Not Disturb will do is monitor if someone comes and opens your laptop, plugs in a USB stick, enters some credentials, et cetera, et cetera. And when it detects that, it will remotely alert you on the iOS device. And you can do things like take a photo. For example, I caught my dog trying to hack me the other day. Apparently, the Russians got to her, too. And you can also initiate a remote shutdown, which is a good thing because a shutdown device, a fully powered off device, is harder to hack. Right? You probably have a firmware password. Full disk encryption is going to be an issue. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, physical mitigations. I mean, one of the most obvious ones is to just cover up your uh, camera. Now, unfortunately, that's not going to prevent all the attacks, for example, some of the attacks that we've done. But it will prevent an attack where malware wants to take a picture while uh, you're away, or maybe you're using it without uh, Skype or something like that. Now, because some malware doesn't care if you, uh, if you notice the light come on. Um, I wish there was something like that for microphones, but there's nothing really that's convenient, uh, except for uh, Objective-C, there is a tool called Oversight. Thanks, Patrick. It's, uh, it'll notify me every time a microphone uh, gets used. Uh, some of the other methodologies you can use is uh, you know, enabling the boot password and the firmware password on your laptop. You know, it's a great way to stop this recovery mode attack. Uh, setting up full disk encryption, so if there is a, a way to bypass uh, your operating system controls, uh, the attacker wouldn't be able to get any information or install any information on your disk. Then also you might want to use uh, biometrics when you're traveling for certain devices, such as your iPhone. Because, at least for now, uh, security cameras can't really lift fingerprints from uh, just looking at them. Um, maybe in the future they will, I don't know. Uh, you, can also, you should also really keep your devices with yourself, because you're in an environment that you don't fully know. Uh, and it's good to keep them around. They're not so heavy, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Finally, I'd say uh, using a safe in a hotel is probably quite useless because if you go online on YouTube and you just search hotel safe security, there's so many ways to bypass it, attack it, uh, and just open them up uh, at will. 
I, I would also say, you know, if you think about it logically, somebody has to have a master key to those safes because if not, there would be tons and tons of hotel rooms with permanently locked safes as travelers forget their pins and don't tell the hotel how to unlock them. Of course, you should always leave it to XKCD to give you the real uh, wisdom here because uh, if you're spending all this resource and time defending some asset, there's probably an easier way to get around, get around it. For example, here he's using a wrench to get your passwords. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody shows up with a wrench and says, give me the information, I'm probably going to do that. Ah, good to know. <laughs> so there's always an easier and cheaper way in most cases. All right, so we've seen some really cool attacks, but unfortunately, we have to wrap this up. Um, you know, some of the things we showed you uh, are not just for the realm of the movies. You know, these things are happening uh, today. You know, there's a lot of evidence of industrial espionage, uh, APT-style uh, attacks. Uh, so just keep yourself safe while you're traveling. Uh, some takeaways, you know, we've seen lots of uh, things about uh, intelligence gathering, how to gain access, how to persist access. Uh, but just a big takeaway is that if, if, you're, um, if you're a hacker, you're, you're likely going to win. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, yourself, as, as you're traveling, you should just give up and let them win. You know, you should keep raising that bar. And hopefully you get to a point where it's so expensive to be an attacker that they would prefer to be used car salesmen. Uh, so one of the ways to do that is to use mitigation tools, you know, like some of the ones we've mentioned here from Objective-C. Again, thanks, Patrick. <laughs> so I would say just, you know, don't trust your networks, compartmentalize, and uh, use sort of a def defense in depth so when you're traveling around, don't log into all of your sensitive information. So that's us. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for RSA for hosting us. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, ask us. Find us online. Find us in the hallways. We're happy to talk about all these ner nerdy attack things. If you have questions about Objective-C or Digita, Patrick is here to answer them. If you have questions about Synac, I'm here to answer that as well. Uh, and with that, I think we have a few minutes for Q&A. Are there any questions? Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for attending. Uh, these slides will be online. And remember, don't leave your devices in your hotel room. And if you want to see the video again, it's available on YouTube.